Genesis 7, we're going to look at some things this evening. I know we've been through Genesis 7, but I, I feel compelled, and I trust of the Lord, to, um, to revisit some things and to preach on a subject that I think, I think needs to be preached on tonight. And so we're going to read just a few verses. I'm going to pick a few out, and um, you just follow along. We'll begin reading in verse 10, and I'll go down to verse 12, and we'll jump over to a few places. I think all of us would agree that um, there are a lot of misconceptions uh, in this world about God. Amen. Uh, people have their own ideas. Everybody wants to invent their own God to their liking. But the way we know God is from his word. Amen. We don't make God. God declares who he is in the Bible. And that's it. I mean, I don't have to pick and choose what I like and don't like. This is what he is. Amen. And tonight we're going to look at an attribute of God that is quite often overlooked. So let's stand, if you're able to stand with me. Just look at verse 10. It came to pass after seven days that the waters of the flood were upon the earth. The 600th year of Noah's life, the second month, 17th day of the month, the same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up, and the windows of heaven were opened. Amen. The rain was upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights. Amen. Look over verse 17 again. The flood was 40 days upon the earth, and the waters increased and bare up the ark. And it was lift up above the earth, and the waters prevailed, and were increased greatly upon the earth. And the ark went upon the face of the waters. The waters prevailed exceedingly upon the earth, and all the high hills that were under the whole heaven were covered. Amen. Fifteen cubits upward did the waters prevail, and the mountains were covered. Amen. And all flesh died that moved upon the earth, both of fowl and of cattle, and of beasts and of every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth, and every man. Amen. All in whose nostrils was the breath of life, of all that was in the dry land, died. Amen. And every living substance was destroyed, which was upon the face of the ground, both man and cattle, the creeping things, and the fowl of the heaven. And they were destroyed from the earth. And Noah only remained alive, and they that were with him in the ark. Amen. The waters prevailed upon the earth in 150 days. Chapter 8. God remembered Noah and every living thing and all the cattle that was with him in the ark. And God made a wind to pass over the earth and the waters assuaged. The fountains also of the deep and the windows of heaven were stopped and the rain from heaven was restrained. The waters returned from off the earth continually and after the end of the 150 days the waters were abated. Verse 4. And the ark rested in the seventh month on the seventeenth day of the month, upon the mountains of Ararat. Amen. Let's stop there and pray. Father, thank you again for this evening. It's been a joy to be in your house already, to fellowship with believers, to sing the great hymns of the faith, and Lord, most of all, to open up your word. Amen. And Lord, I pray tonight that your word would have free course in our hearts. Yes, pray, Lord. Lord, help us to understand exactly what you did here with this flood, yes. please, Lord, open our eyes and help us to realize who you are. Amen. God, I pray your blessing. I ask for a fresh filling of thy spirit. I need your enablement as I preach thy word. And give us all this evening ears to hear. Yes. But we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank Amen. you. You may be seated. Last week, we saw that after approximately... 80 years of building the ark, and warning mankind about God's coming judgment, that Noah and his wife and his three sons and their wives, after 80 long years of preaching and building and preaching and building, the day finally came that God told them to get on the ark. Their entrance into the ark was followed, if you remember, I mentioned this last uh, week, by a miraculous procession of animals. Here they came, two by two. Two of every kind, male and female, 
And after this long seven day miraculous procession into the ark, we read in verse 16 of chapter 7 that God shut the door. Amen. All opportunity was over. After that door was shut, our God, the God of heaven, the God you and I know, the God of the Bible, the Lord Jesus Christ, if you will, who is God, Lord. brought upon this world his greatest act of judgment yet experienced in the word of God. Amen. A worldwide flood. By the way, there's worse to come. Amen. Can I say that again? There is worse to come. Amen. After the rapture of the church, we understand that uh, there will be a seven-year tribulation, a, a time of unprecedented evil, if you will, catastrophe upon this earth that we read of in Revelation chapter 4 and verse 19. There's more to come. Right. Not to mention the eternal judgment of all people that do not receive the Lord Jesus Christ uh, in a place called hell. There's judgment to come. But there have been nothing like it before. And every time you and I see a rainbow, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, according to chapter 9 and verse 13 through 16, we know that there will never be another flood like that again. Amen. That's what the rainbow is. Now there are many critics, though, that exist today of the Bible that do not want to admit that there was a flood. They, they do not want to admit that there was a man named Noah. They do not want to admit that this man built a, an ark. And they do not want to admit that God judged this earth by a worldwide flood. They say, oh no, that didn't happen. You'll hear it over and over again. May I remind us tonight that that's the way God said it would be in the last days. That there would be scoffers that would say that. Right. Hold your hand here and go to 2 Peter chapter 3 for a moment if you will. God said that in the last days there would be scoffers walking after their own lusts in verse 3 of 2 Peter chapter 3. These scoffers, we are told, would be, notice a phrase in verse 5, willingly ignorant of two events. One is creation. Amen. The other is a flood. Notice verse 3, that knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts. And saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. Amen. They're willingly ignorant of that. One writer wrote this, one commentator said, quote, many scientists do not want to admit that this flood could have caused the fossil and geological formations that prevail upon the earth. Do you understand that fossils require a cataclysmic event? The very existence of them proclaims something that was quickly buried by water? He went on to say, some may admit that there must have been a flood of some sort to account for the formation of fossils, but they do not accept Noah's flood. Why? Why not? Why are we willingly ignorant? Why would they say, no, we don't want to admit that. We don't want to admit to creation. We don't want to admit that there was a flood. Well, the primary reason that they do not want to accept Noah and uh, uh, the flood is because then they would have to then accept the Bible. Right. Uh, which means they would have to accept God and the God of the Bible, and they would have to accept the fact that this same God judges sin. That's, right. That's why they're willingly, willingly ignorant. You see, it is a flood that proves uh, one thing beyond a shadow of a doubt, and that is this. And this is really what the message is about tonight, and that our God is a God of judgment. Amen. And he is a God that we ought to fear. Amen. But do we? Oh, we can point to the liberals and say, well, they don't fear God. God's their buddy. God's the man upstairs. He, uh, he's their pal, you know. Uh, uh, they don't think he hates sin. No, we say that about the liberals. But what about me and you? Amen. Do 
we realize that our God is a God of judgment and do we fear him as we should? Personal confession, I do not. And I need to. Amen. So I want to preach on the subject again, the God of judgment. Do we fear him? You know, there are many attributes that we find described or displayed in the Bible about God. In other words, things that tell us what God is like, who He is and what He is like. For example, there are His natural attributes. The fact that He is all-powerful, omnipotent. Amen. He is everywhere present, omnipresent. He is omniscient. He is all-knowing. That's what the Bible declares He is. Amen. Our God is everywhere present. He is all-knowing and He is all-powerful. These are His natural attributes. Then we learn of His moral attributes as well. In other words, we have a God that is holy. Amen? Amen. He is holy. He is righteous. He is loving. Amen. He is merciful. He is truth and upright and good. And many more attributes we could list tonight. Amen. The one attribute that mankind, a particularly unregenerate mankind, often repels is the attribute of judgment. Right. That our God is a God that judges sin. Amen. Do you believe that tonight? Amen. Should I say this? Do we act like we believe that tonight? <laughs> Psalm 96 and verse 13, just to give you some scriptural proof of this truth, we read, He shall judge the world with righteousness and the people with His truth. Amen. Psalm 58, 11, Verily He is a God that judgeth in the earth. Psalm 67 and verse 4, Thou shalt judge the people righteously. Amen. Proverbs 11, 31, The righteous shall be recompensed in the earth, much more the wicked and the sinner. Amen. Ecclesiastes 11, 9, Know thou that for all these things uh, God will bring thee into judgment. Amen. That's the Bible, my friend. Ecclesiastes 12, 14, God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. Romans chapter 2 and verse 16, listen to this. In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. Amen. That's right. That calls us to shake in our boots. Amen. That God is going to judge the very secrets of men. Right. You know, the world does not want a God of judgment. They don't. They don't want a God that we ought to fear. They don't want a God that they are accountable to. They do not want a God that one day they will face uh, that knows everything about us. But quite often, even believers, we don't act like we want a God of judgment either. Right. We sin. We do things we should not do. We say things that displease God. We, we do things that displease God. We look at things that displease God. Amen. And we act as if nothing happened. Amen. We act as if God forgot about it. We don't get right about it. We don't fall on our face and ask God for forgiveness. 1 John 1, 9. We don't do that. We just go on and on in our sin. As if nothing happened. Amen. Perhaps we've forgotten there's a God of judgment. Amen. Who judges sin. Amen. And the greatest event in the Bible that shows us this is this flood. Just how serious was this flood? It was very serious. Amen. What I'd like to do tonight is just kind of pick it apart a little bit and show us all just how serious a thing this was when God judged the earth by a flood. Amen. Notice, first of all, number one, the specifics of the water. You see what do you mean by that? You know, when God decided to judge the earth and destroy mankind, how did he choose to do it? He chose to send a great flood upon this world. I want you to think about it for a moment. The entire earth, the entire earth would be covered by water. Talk more about that in a little bit. This flood came rather quickly upon the earth. And I want to ask us tonight, how did God do that? Well, we know he could do it just by speaking and we understand that. But where in the world did all this water come from? How did he do it? Uh, many people have always thought that the water, the source of the water from the flood came only by rain. But it wasn't just rain. That's right. You know, there were possibly three, possibly, definitely two, and quite possibly three main sources of water for the flood. You say, what were they? Well, first, number one, we see the waters from the rain. Certainly it did rain. Notice chapter 7 and verse 4. 
For yet seven days and I will cause it to rain upon the earth, forty days and forty nights, and every living substance that I have made will I destroy from off the face of the earth. So we see the rain. Look at verse 12. And the rain was upon the earth forty days and forty nights. Uh, so understand something here. The, uh, one of the sources of the water came from the rain. But may I say that this was not just a little drizzle. It was not just a sprinkle. The Hebrew word for the word rain, a geshem, suggests an absolute violent rain. Just a couple of weeks ago, I was driving up Route 1. And I'll tell you what, all of a sudden, this downpour came. And it, it sounded like rocks hitting the windshield. I mean, it was an absolute torrential downpour. And that's a nothing to what we're talking about here. Here in the days of the flood, it was this great uh, torrential downpour that came down over the entire earth. And this downpour would continue nonstop for 40 straight days. Amen. Can you imagine that? No doubt this would be a miracle. Normally, clouds do not hold that much water. But it, appeared, it would appear from the scripture that it had never rained before upon the earth. Never happened. You say, where do you get that? Well, go back to Genesis chapter 2. Let me see if I can explain this, what, what is probably it was here. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 5. Notice we read, in every plant of the field before it was in the earth, I'm sorry, in every plant of the field before it was in the earth, and every herb of the field before it grew, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth. And there was not a man to till the ground. Notice, notice verse 6. But there went up a mist from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. In other words, for the first 1,656 years of the earth, and that's when Noah's flood occurred, after 1,656 years that the earth was in existence, for those years God watered the earth by a mist. He sent up this mist, almost like a dew, that watered all the plants. But notice the flood introduced something that they probably had never seen before, it would appear, and that is rain. And this rain was one of the sources of the flood. It came from the sky. But that wasn't the only place it came from. The second source is the waters from what, what I'm going to call the release. You say, what do you mean by that? Well, notice in chapter 7, in verse, 7, in verse 11. So one of the sources was from the rain, this torrential downpour for 40 straight days and 40 straight nights. But then notice we read in chapter 7, in verse 11, towards the end, uh, the same day, notice, uh, were all the fountains of the great deep broken up. Here it is, and I'll get to that one in a moment. And the windows of heaven were open. This appears to be a figure of speech. Some believe that God released water from the heavens, which were what's called the waters above the firmament. You say, what do you mean by that? Well, let's go back to Genesis chapter 1. We're doing a little Bible study tonight. Are we having fun yet? The reason I'm doing this is because sometimes people are going to challenge what you believe about the flood. They're going to ask you questions. Where did all that water come from? How did it rain like that? What kind of flood was it? I'm going to try to give us the answers tonight. Amen. Notice Genesis chapter 1 and verse 7, what we read. And uh, God, let's look at verse 6. And God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. Watch this. And God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament, firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. Amen. You see, on the second day of creation... When God created the atmosphere, he divided what it says here, the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. In other words, from the days of creation to the days of Noah, some believe that there was this canopy. In other words, there was waters above the firmament in the our atmosphere and then the waters below. It is believed that this created somewhat of a greenhouse effect on the earth. And that would account for the long lifespans of mankind that we see and the large size of things that they find in what they call the fossil record, if you will. When it was time for the flood, what had happened was, as this canopy of water is above uh, this firmament, uh, the rain came down, but God also released those waters from above as well. Some believe that happened. 
So we see the waters from the rain coming down from the clouds. We see the waters from the release of that firmament, that canopy that was over the earth. But there was a third source, and that is this, the waters from the reservoirs. Look at chapter 7 and verse 11. I already read it. Let's go back there. Notice we read in the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, the same day, notice, were all the fountains of the great deep broken up and the windows of heaven were open. Amen. Notice the phrase, uh, the fountains of the deep were broken up. So we are told, again, there is this water from these reservoirs. Uh, we are told that the water came from both above the earth and it came from below the earth, from this uh, area that the Bible refers to as the fountains of the great deep. What were they? What are you talking about, these fountains of the great deep? What they were, were subterranean reservoirs of water. By the way, they're still there today. Amen. There, they are, there are still subterranean reservoirs of water under the crust of the earth. Even today, scientists contend that there are large bodies of water buried beneath the earth's surface, containing as much water as in every ocean combined. That was an article written by the Atlantic, Daniel Weiner Bronner, not a fundamental Baptist think tank, by the way. That's what they believe. The water from these reservoirs, understand, was released. In other words, the Bible says there was a breaking up. In other words, here's what was happening when that flood took place. It began to rain torrentially from the clouds. Uh, uh, then the firmament, the waters uh, in the canopy were also released. Then all over the earth were these great volcanic type eruptions, uh, earthquakes of great magnitudes, and the waters from the fountains of the deeps were spewing out all over the place. Amen. Can you imagine the scene? Amen. Answers in Genesis writes this, quote, evidently the source for water below the ground was in great subterranean pools or fountains of fresh water which were broke open by volcanic and seismic earthquake activity. These fountains perhaps supplied water uh, for the rivers in the Garden of Eden as well as the rest of the earth before the uh, flood. My point is this. Here we see the days of Noah. Everything before the flood was at peace. Right. Quiet. Right. Never saw rain. Here's this man proclaiming judgment is coming. God's going to judge this earth. Uh, there's going to be a great flood. Uh, and they're kind of looking down their nose at him, going about their lives. Let me show you what I mean by that. Hold your hand here. I'm trying to paint a picture here. Go to Matthew chapter 24. Notice what the Lord Jesus said. Matthew chapter 24. Look, if you will, at verse 37. Because Christ is saying that the same type of attitude is going to prevail before his second coming. Amen. Notice we read in verse 37, but as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were, as in the days that were before the flood, notice what they're doing. Uh, nothing unusual. They were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage uh, until the day that Noah entered into the ark. In other words, they were walking around as if they had no care in the world, no belief in God's judgment. They're eating and drinking and going about life, marrying and so forth, until that day finally came. Amen. And can you see the rain pouring down? Can you see the firmament coming down? Can you see the great volcanoes and eruptions and the water spewing out of the ground? Whatever. They quickly learned the truth. Of this, Hebrews 10.31, it is a fearful thing to fall in the hands of the living God. Amen. Folks, once it's time for judgment, it's too late. Right. Get things right in your heart and your life tonight. If you're not saved, get, deal with it tonight. Amen. So we see the specifics of the water. Secondly, I want you to notice back in, uh, no, I was going to say, Genesis chapter 7. Notice the size of the flood. So how big was this thing anyway? Again, I'm trying to help us to equip us tonight. One scoffer wrote of the flood wrote this. Listen to what he wrote. 
I was reading this. My blood was boiling a little bit. Sometimes it's good to get the blood boiling. Amen. He said, the flood myth is a story of God, quote, uncreating the world by allowing the ancient eternal ocean to flood the space below the firmament. Once his temper tantrum was over, he magicked the water out from beneath the dome. None uh, of this actually happened in reality, of course. It is a myth. He says they may, they may actually, there may actually be some truth to the story. It's a tale from Gilgamesh around a time where, they actually, where there actually was a great flood in that region. There are also many other cultures that describe flood events, but they are likely separate from the Gilgamesh Noah story. The details of any gods, giant arcs, and one lucky guy are where things seem to turn into myth. Interesting. Well, my friend, if you were here, I'd say this. It actually did happen. Amen. There was a flood. That's right. Because the Bible declares it. Jesus Christ confirmed it, and the scientific evidence displays it. You are just being willingly ignorant. That's right. That's what I'd say. And the same God that you are mocking, the same God you are talking about a temper tantrum, is going to be the same God you're going to face one day. Amen. Amen. Local flood myth. Come on now. Two things about this great judgment of God. Number one, about this size of the flood. Notice its dimensions. How big was it? Chapter 7, verse 19. And the waters prevailed exceedingly. Notice upon the earth. Oh, here it is. And all the high hills that were under the whole heaven were covered. Fifteen cubits upward did the waters prevail, and the mountains were covered. Watch this. The fifteen cubits he's talking about there in verse 20 refers to how high the water was above the highest mountain. Amen. Fifteen cubits is about 22 feet. It's not a 22 feet foot flood waters. Right. He's talking about above the highest mountain that existed, uh, uh, 15 cubits. Uh, we also learned that this flood had covered the entire earth. Yeah. All of it. Oh, I won't read it for time's sake. Genesis chapter 6 and verse 5 talks about the entire earth. Uh, chapter 6 and verse 11, verse 12, verse 13 and verse 17. Chapter 7 and verse 4 and verse 8, verse 19. All of them speak of this flood coming upon the entire earth. And the entire earth that you and I are standing on right now was submerged in water for 150 days. Amen. Look at chapter 7, verse 24. And the waters prevailed upon the earth 150 days. By the way, if uh, the flood was only in the part of the earth, if the flood was merely a local flood, then why would Noah be told of God to build an ark? God would have just said, move. Go somewhere else. It's dimensions worldwide. And then notice its duration. How long did it last? The flood lasted a long time. The waters upon the earth lasted a long time. If you count from the time that the flood started, when it started raining in chapter 7 and verse 11 and 12, to the time in chapter 8 and verse 15 and 16, when Noah is told to get off the, uh, the ark, uh, uh, the duration of the entire flood was a little over a year. A year, that's a long time. Let me give you some examples. Uh, chapter 7 and verse 11. On the second month, the 17th day, 17th day is when the flood began. Notice the month. Second month, 17th day. Then in the seventh month, in the 17th day, five months later, the ark grounded after five months. The tenth month, on the first day, close to three months later, now land became visible. And then the first month of the first day, two months later, the ark covered, the hatch was removed by Noah, according to chapter 8 and verse 13. Then the second month, the 27th day, a entire year later, and ten days, they got off the ark. Amen. Point is, it was a massive, 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 life-ending, devastating Amen. flood. Amen. I wonder if we can even a little bit understand that. I don't think we can. Right. You know, I thought I'd do a little research. I said, well, let me find out. What is, the, what is the worst flood that ever occurred in the United States? 
And so I looked it up, and it said the, word, the worst flood recorded in the United States was the Johnstown flood of 1889. Now, mind you, compare this to the flood of Noah. Listen to what they said about this flood. The World Atlas describes it this way. Quote, uh, one of the deadliest natural disasters experienced in the United States and was the worst flood in U.S. history. An estimated 2,209 people lost their lives to, due to this flood. Now, I'm not trying to mock that people died. I think that's sad. But compare that to the flood of Noah. Amen. The flood is also known as the Great Flood of 1889 and took place on May 31st. Uh, and it was caused by the collapse of the uh, South Fork Dam. The rivers upstream had experienced heavy rainfall, as much as 10 inches of rain. The towns of Johnstown and South Fork were destroyed by the floods, leading to an estimated $453 million in property damage. That was for that little flood compared to Noah's flood. Amen. My point is this, folks. Our God is a God of judgment. Amen. And his judgment is a very serious thing. Praise which Lord. leads me to the third point. Praise not only the specifics of the water, not only the size of the flood, notice the seriousness of God's judgment. Let's read it once again in verse 21 of chapter 7. And all flesh died that moved upon the earth, both of fowl and of cattle and of beasts and of every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth, and every man, Amen. all in whose nostrils was the breath of life, of all that was in the dry land died. Amen. And every living substance was destroyed, which was upon the face of the ground, both man and cattle and the creeping things and the fowl of heaven, and they were destroyed from the earth. And Noah only remained alive, and they that were with him in the ark, and the waters prevailed upon the earth in 150 days. Notice what we read in verse 21, 24, 22. Watch this. All flesh died. Amen. All flesh. Right. I don't know if you ever did any... Uh, if you have any interest in the Civil War. But some of those battles in the Civil War were the deadliest battles that you could ever imagine. I mean, strewn across fields in America were certain places that the, the bloodshed was so bad that they say you could literally walk from one side of the field to the other without, without ever touching the ground if you stepped on bodies. And we think about that, of the people that died. But I want you to think about this. All the flesh on the earth, every human being except for Noah and his wife and his sons and their uh, wives died. Drowning in this flood were all the fowls, were all the cattle, were all the creeping things and every single human being. God literally wiped out civilization. Amen. Except for Noah and his family. Amen. You say, how many, how many were there? That's a good question. You know, Answers in Genesis estimates there was at least, at least 750 million people on the earth. But as high as, because of the long lifespans, it would not be unreasonable to say that there was possibly 4 billion people in the earth. Wow. Dead. Except for eight. Folks, judgment, God's judgment's a serious thing. Yeah, amen. You know, to get an idea of how many people died, I want you to think about this. This may be a weird thought, but do you know where we get gasoline from? And by now, we get it from crude oil. You know where we get crude oil from? Petroleum. Petroleum gets refined into crude oil, gets refined into gasoline. Where does that petroleum come from? Here it is. It, it, it comes from the remains of dead organisms. Right. Do you know every time you pump your gas? This is a weird kind of thought. <laughs> Somebody told me this once. I've never forgotten it. It's sad though, isn't it? We're pumping the remains of the flood of all the people and things that died. Where, do all, where does all that, that crude oil and petroleum come from? How did it get buried so deep? All of it, these massive, massive 
uh, areas that are filled with it. Where did that come from? It came from the flood. Amen. All those dead people and animals. Do you know they find uh, weird things, uh, uh, bones of, of, of people, and all kind of twisted together, and they kind of wonder why. Well, they know why, if you're a creationist, it's from the runoff of the flood. As waters swirl, you've seen it in creeks and things. It gathers those things together. But they don't want to believe that. Point is, again, it was an enormous... And then God repeats himself in verse 23. He says basically the same. He says again, and every living substance was destroyed. Wait a minute, you just said it. He says, yes, I'm trying to get you to understand this. Amen. Amen. All flesh died. Every human being except for Noah and his family died. Millions upon millions, possibly billions of people dead. Right. Because of God's judgment. Why would God repeat that? I'll tell you why. He wants us to take serious the fact Amen. that he's a God of judgment. Right. And he hates sin as much today as he's ever hated sin. But thank God you and I have an answer to our sin. And that is the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. All of us are sinners destined for hell, but God provided us a way out, a way to salvation through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. But without him, understand, you will, will face a, a God of judgment. Right. Hebrews 12, 29. For our God is a consuming fire. Right. Here's my point. We need to get back to fearing God. Amen. We need to get back to the place where we understand when we think of our God as a God of judgment uh, that one of the greatest evidences of that is this flood in the Bible and what he did to mankind. Why? Because he hates sin and he judges sin and he will keep his word. Amen. So I hope tonight if you're not saved, you get saved. Amen. You know, we live in a world where carnal man complains about a God who would judge, criticizes God for overreacting, complains when sin is dealt with, when children are disciplined, when criminals are sent to prison, and any force is shown in a time of warfare, they cry out, why are you being so harsh? The problem is they don't perceive the extreme sinfulness and destructiveness of sin. I hope that Capital Baptist Church never gets to the place where we take lightly the holiness of God Amen. and how great and wonderful He is and that our God is yeah. indeed a God of judgment. Amen. If you're not saved, take care of it tonight. Amen. If you are saved, understand that sin is a serious thing. When you and I do something we're not supposed to do and we say something we're not supposed to say when we're not being what we ought to be we ought to immediately as quickly as we can go to that person make it right go to our God and make it right instead of just keep plowing on in life as if it never happened. Amen. Right. Amen. Because in a sense when we do that we're shaking our fist in the face of a God who's a consuming fire. Amen. Let's get it right tonight. Amen. Amen. Let's pray together.